Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Jamie McDowell, and I'm the branch manager here at the Fairview Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for easy to find medicinal plants of our area. Before we get started with tonight's program, I wanted to go over a couple of quick housekeeping things. Tonight's program is being recorded. So if you would like an encore presentation or if you know anyone that wasn't able to make it tonight, we will have the recording posted up on the library's YouTube channel in about a week or so from tonight. We are in Zoom webinar mode tonight. So that means all of your cameras and microphones have been disabled. The only people that you'll be able to see are myself and Corey Pine. The chat feature has also been disabled, but we are doing a Q&A. So if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen there in that black toolbar, you'll see three icons in the middle. The one uh, on the right, the third one on the right there is your Q&A feature. So if you have any questions during tonight's presentation, go ahead and click on that. You can type your question in any time. Corey Pine is going to be stopping about twice throughout the presentation, and I'll help moderate those uh, questions for him. With regards to the type of questions that you could put in there, tonight's presentation is not an appropriate place to ask personal health questions or to ask medical advice, whether personal or general health issues. But any other questions, feel free to go ahead and throw those in there, and um, Corey Pine will be happy to answer them throughout the program. Uh, as you may have seen when you came into the program, uh, a little programming disclaimer that we have, and I'm gonna go ahead and pull that back up and read that for you. So the contents of this presentation are for informational purposes only. Nothing herein constitutes medical, legal, or financial advice nor is it a substitute for professional medical advice, professional legal advice, and or professional advice on any issues related to medical manufacturing, diagnosis, and or treatment. You should not rely on the information received in this presentation for medical, legal, or financial decisions. Always consult with an appropriate professional for specific advice related to your situation. The views and opinions expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect those of Buncombe County or its public library system, and always consult a healthcare provider before using any medicinal plants or beginning any new health regime. So with that being said, I am going to introduce tonight's speaker. Corey Pine Shane is the founder and director of the Blue Ridge School of Herbal Medicine near Asheville, North Carolina. He has spent over 25 years helping clients and teaching people by artfully blending Chinese and Western herbal traditions with a focus on local plants. His new book, Southeast Medicinal Plants, which we do have available at the library, covers how to identify, ethically harvest, and use the medicinal plants of the Southeast. Corey Pine has taught across the United States and in Europe at many national herb conferences and is a professional member of the American Herbalist Guild. Corey Pine, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Cool, thank you, Jamie. Thanks for inviting me here. I'm, it's, it's exciting, glad to be here. Hi everyone, hope this lighting is okay. Um, yeah, I'm Corey Pine. I've been living in the Asheville area for, well, since the mid nineties. Uh, I love this area. I love the mountains around here. It really just drew me in and made me feel at home. And, and while I've been here, I've been exploring the native plants, the, well, not just the native plants, but the native plants, the introduced plants, the, uh, the incredible diversity we have in these mountains. Um, if you're not familiar, Western North Carolina is actually one of the most biodiverse place, temperate places in, in the world. Um, partly because it's been a long time since we've had glaciers down here. Don't know if we've, maybe like, it's probably been, don't wanna guess in geological time, but most of the um, last few ice ages have not come down nearly as far. And so, um, yeah, we've been spared that, but also the Northern plants have kind of traveled down because glaciers move at a glacial pace. And um, as the glaciers have melted, 
the those more northern plants stay at the high elevations like Mount Mitchell or Mount Pisgah, Black Balsam up in the parkway. Um, and then the southern plants start moving up over the hundreds, thousands of years. So welcome. Um, yeah, as Jamie said, I, I run the Blue Ridge School of Herbal Medicine. Uh, I live here in Barnardsville, so I'm kind of the other side of Asheville from, from Fairview in particular. Uh, I do plant walks all over. And uh, yeah, I'll, I take a moment to just show off my book. But <clears throat> if you go to the Fairview Library, or actually maybe any of the any bunk combined, I haven't really checked which libraries carry it, but I know at least the Fairview Library carries it. This is what, this is what you're looking for. Uh, Southeast Medicinal Plants is a book. People ask me how long it took to write this. I say like, well, technically about a year, year and a half, but really half a lifetime. So the plants I'm gonna talk about today are in this book. Um, and they're also, like I picked ones that I feel like are easy to find. The point of tonight's lecture, it's a short, short class, we're only here for an hour. I picked plants that should be easy to recognize, relatively easy to recognize, nothing's foolproof. So um, I recommend using like a good identification guide. Like I, I like to use Newcombs, N-E-W-C-O-M-B, Newcombs Wildflower Guide, um, and also Wildflowers of Tennessee the Ohio Valley and the Southern Appalachians. But if you Google it, just Google wildflowers of Tennessee. I believe Horn and Cathcart are the authors. Those are the two books I tend to use for like plant identification in the wild. If I see a plant I'm not sure of. Um, that's, the number, that's the number one thing is before you try any of these things, make sure you have the right plant. So plant identification is so important. So if you're not familiar with these plants, um, make sure you look up and have the right, <laughs> have the right plant. Um, it's not that we're necessarily going to poison ourselves, but you also just want to know that you're taking the right thing. I mean, potentially we could poison ourselves, but plants I'm going to talk about today don't have poisonous lookalikes. Um, they might give you an upset stomach. They might not taste great, but they're not. They're not going to do what we want them to do. How about that? And have my little. San Pellegrino today. Cheers. Um, so identification is first. I'm going to start off with trees and then move to weeds. So we're going to talk about trees and weeds, things you can find in your yard, things you can find on the roadside. You don't necessarily want to harvest on a roadside, at least not on the busy roadside. Uh, maybe if you live on like a small road and only have two neighbors, on the road, then you know maybe that's okay. But generally, we want to harvest or on the side of your driveway. But we generally want to harvest, you know, at least twenty feet away from like a like a from a road, and usually not next to like a busy road, pollution, all that. So I'm going to start talking about plants because there's a lot that we could talk about. We only have a short time, like an hour is, you know, as so much we could talk about in just an hour. There's I'm going to. Go for about 20 minutes, stop for questions. Um, got my clock down here. If you see me like looking off to the right, that's what that is. Um, and so feel free to just type in questions in the Q and A whenever they come up. And then when we stop, uh, Jamie will go through those questions and then pose those to me. And uh, yeah, let's begin. Let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. I've put together Nothing fancy, just a real, oh, that's the wrong one. Okay, I'm trying to share my screen here. There we go, that's the right screen. Okay, so easy to find medicinal plants in the Asheville area. And there's my school, Blue Ridge School of Herbal Medicine, with little pine tree, cause woo, I'm Corey Pine. Um, here we go. So con here's, I'm realizing I actually wrote this slide. And then this afternoon I was like, well, what if we cover all of those really quickly? So I added two or three more. And then I made, I mean, I'm an herbalist. I could, I could talk for eight hours just about, you know, just plants of our area. So 
These are ones I think that are easy to identify, that are common and that are useful. Like a lot of plants are medicinal, but just because it's medicinal doesn't mean you necessarily need that plant or you're going to use that plant. You know, if, if you never get constipated, you're never going to need that herb that's for constipation or that herb for, you know, appendicitis. Um, so I'm talking about three, three trees and three weeds. And then I actually added on a few more plants afterwards. The trees are sumac, sassafras, and mimosa. Um, and then the invasive, the invasive plants. I chose invasive plants because a lot of people love talking about the, the woodland plants, the plants that we have to like go off in the Pisgah National Forest or like state forests to find and things like black cohosh, blue cohosh, wild yam, ginseng. Those are amazing plants. Uh, they're getting of wild pretty quickly. And so as an ethical and sustainable wild crafter, I really encourage you all to learn the plants that are around you, learn the plants that are so abundant that they're weed. They're just like taking over, that it's, you're doing the planet a service by harvesting more of these plants, you know? It's a nice little uh, exchange we can do. So these three weeds I talk about here, kudzu, actually does have medicinal properties. Um, you know, they say like, don't leave your window open at night and the kudzu will just come in. Uh, kudzu, honeysuckle, Japanese knotweed are what we're gonna talk about. So a little bit about each of these, let's see. Only the first two are actually native plants, sumac and sassafras. The rest are all uh, plants from other parts of the world. So let's talk about sumac. Um, so sumac, sumac is a tree. I just see this all the time in the sides of the road. Like I see it on um, Barnesville Highway, you know, 197 out here. Pretty sure I've seen it on 74A, you know, in Fairview. So um, this is like a medium sized tree. This is not a huge tree. This is probably 10 or 15 feet high. I zoomed in this photo so you could actually see the little clusters of berries there. Um, not sure if you can see my pointer. Whoops. Let's see, what does this do? Uh, yeah, there we go. So we can see, I'm gonna like circle this here. These are like the clusters of berries right there. That's the part that you actually use for medicine. There's three different species here. You can use them all. There's staghorn sumac, smooth sumac, and uh, winged sumac. Uh, but they all have these clusters of red berries. There is a poison sumac. It has white berries and it grows in marshes. So it's less than like 1% of 1% of the sumac you're gonna find, but it will give you a really bad rash. But they're pretty easy to tell apart because the um, the poison sumac looks like poison ivy, except it's a tree instead of a vine. In other words, poison sumac has white berries and it only has three leaflets instead of this, which has, if you can see here, like that's all one leaf and it has, I don't know, 17, 19 leaflets, pretty obviously not just three, like poison ivy would have. It is the same family as poison ivy, just FYI, but this will not cause a rash. I've never seen it cause a rash on anyone in all my years of handling sumac. Um, it is a little bit confusing though, because I do see like a lot of like, um, a lot of local folks use the word sumac, the word sumac to mean anything that causes a skin rash, but it's not true. This is actually a really amazing plant that's really good to know. And even though I say this is the same family as poison ivy, it is. But it's also the same family as mangoes and cashews. So it's not a poisonous, it's not like everything in that family is toxic. It's just some things are. So sumac, I have the botanical name underneath these for those of you who are following along. This is probably the smooth sumac rus glabra. Okay, so medicinal uses. 
I've heard people call sumac the lemonade tree because those berries that are circling there, you just cut that whole bunch of berries, you drop it in a gallon of water and put it out in the sun for a few hours, two hours, three hours, uh, and you make a sun tea. And then you strain out the berries. And basically what it makes is pink lemonade. You have to wonder like, where did pink lemonade originally come from? Maybe you was sumac, who's to say? Um, these days it probably comes from, you know, red dye number four, but back in the old days, could have been sumac. Uh, I don't have historical proof to back that up. This is just completely hypothetical. Uh, it is very high in vitamin C and it tastes, has that vitamin C kind of flavor. It really does taste like lemonade. Uh, like lemons, it, it does help to add a little bit of sweetener. <laughs> it's, not, it's not as sour as, as lemons, but you know, you might want to add a little bit to it. Because it's room temperature, it's a little hard to get sugar to dissolve. So I'll, sometimes I'll just use maple syrup in there. Mostly I just I find it very refreshing, but it's also cooling. It's cooling, it's antioxidant. Um, it's kind of a, it's a great summertime tea. I tend to harvest it. Those berries are ripe in like August and September. Though I was just driving back from the post office today and I still see sumac berries in the side of the road. Right now, the, a lot of vitamin C, vitamin C is fairly water soluble. So a lot of the vitamin C in there by February has been washed out by the rain, but you might still get like a little sour, might be a little bit tang to it. I, I find if I harvest sumac this time of year, it doesn't really have as nearly as much flavor as if you harvest it like September, October, November, but it'll have something. Um, and it was also used medicinally. Uh, I haven't used it this way, but traditionally it was used for irritation of the urinary tract. I don't know that it's actually antiseptic, antibacterial or anything like that. Uh, I don't think of it so much for like fighting an infection, but you could combine it with something um, that's like an antiviral or antibacterial uh, to help with the irritation that goes along with an infection. So, okay, let's go on to the next plant. Good, so that's sumac, S-U-M-A-C. Sumac, by the way, one more thing about sumac, it's used a lot as a spice. I find that like it's used a lot in uh, Middle Eastern food as a spice. It's one of the ingredients in za'atar, za'atar. Um, but I know sometimes like I, <laughs> Sometimes I like eating lunch at the uh, Gypsy Queen down in uh, West Asheville. And uh, they have, it's, it's Lebanese food, I believe it's Lebanese, Lebanese food, pretty sure. And they will put sumac sometimes, like ground up sumac berries on top of the hummus or on top of certain dishes. You can actually buy whole sumac berries there, it might be powdered, but you can buy the sumac berry spice there as well. It's probably not, not our local sumac. It's probably a Middle Eastern species of sumac. But nevertheless, as far as I know, interchangeable. Next plant. Let's see. What about sassafras? Sassafras, it's a tree. This is a really young tree. This one is only like two or three feet tall. Usually when I spot them, they're about like 15, 20 feet tall. But the truth is they can actually grow up to be like 40, I've even seen stuff like 50 feet high. The funny thing is they don't leaf out down at the base. So no one ever notices that they get that high because the leaves are just like all clustered at the top of the tree. Uh, but they're much easier to spot when they're like, you know, eye level. You can spot them because they have the, the three different types of leaves. They have the, um, you know, kind of like the football shaped leaf here. They have the uh, mitten. Okay, see this mitten here. The mitten shaped leaf. Oh, I like this highlighter. This is cool. And then they have the, I like to call it the dinosaur footprint leaf. It's big to do. Like just really working on my trackpad skills here. Here we go. So three different types of leaf. The only other tree that I know does this that's at all similar would be mulberry. Mulberry can be a little bit of a, there's a species of mulberry that can be a little bit weedy around here, but <clears throat> mulberry that does have different shapes leaves, but the actual, um, 
leaves is very different. They're not nearly as rounded as the sassafras. So sassafras, you can eat the leaves. Leaves are tasty. Matter of fact, they're, they're very like um, misogynous. And what that means is that it's uh, moistening. If you chew on it, it it'll, it's like, um, like oatmeal, except not hot and sticky, but it'll just like moisten your mouth a little bit. So it's a nice little trail snack. Don't eat a whole lot of them because, you know, the tree needs them to photosynthesize. But, you know, pick a leaf here, pick a leaf over there. Uh, the root is the part that we use in medicine, though. And this is, let's see, let's get to the medicinal use slide. slide. The root and the root bark are used. And it tastes like it's the same family as cinnamon and also camphor. Also, interestingly enough, avocados, but we'll just set that aside for now. And it tastes like root beer. That's not a coincidence. Matter of fact, people always say sassafras. It tastes like root beer, but it's the opposite. Root beer tastes like sassafras because sassafras was one of the ingredients along with sarsaparilla, which is a totally different plant with a similar sounding name. Sassafras and sarsaparilla were cooked together, simmered together, cooled off, and then made either into a soda or into a fermented uh, alcoholic beverage called root beer. And that's where we get, you know, very little relationship, like, you know, brand name root beers these days compared to like the tradition of actual root beers, where it was actually a beer, an alcoholic beverage made from roots. And probably the alcoholic beverage was not used to get drunk. I mean, technically you could. It was just a way of preserving a tea. So, um, you know, beer, not for the sake of inebriation, but beer as a medicinal substance to like um, preserve a medicinal plant. Sassafras is one of the, the just probably one of the most well-known medicinal plants in Southern Appalachia, just because of root beer. Uh, but it was used for so many things uh, because it does two things really well. It moves the blood. In other words, it kind of like gets the blood moving. It stimulates circulation, kind of like cinnamon or ginger. It's, it's heating, it's warming, it warms us up. But at the same time, it cleanses the blood. And what that means, it helps increase organs of elimination. And the com the, that combination was really helpful for everything from uh, arthritis to cancer to um, sometimes just add like a little bit into a tea or a tincture to like add a nice flavor um, and to like kind of like warm up a formula. It's just a general, it's just a really nice tea. You know, if you take the roots, the, the root bark technically was what, what was used, and that can be helpful if you have really big roots, but the roots are small, just chop them up whole, wash them, then chop them up whole, and just simmer that for a while. And just like uh, simmer that for like 20 or 30 minutes and drink that tea. And it is not only delicious, but it, I find a lot of clarity after I uh, drink it. Like I feel more clear. My brain feels, it's easier to think more clearly. So let's do the third. Yeah, that looks good. Let's do the third tree and then we'll take a break. I'm, I'm talking fast, but I'm trying, I want to like get through a lot of information, convey a lot. I know you're taking time out of your life to be here. I want to make sure you get a lot of information from this and it's recorded. So you can all go back and watch this again. If I'm going too fast, if I'm not going fast enough this time for questions, you can ask more. This is, these are the flowers of mimosa. So just so you know, it has, I really don't know what the relationship is between the mimosa tree and the beverage. I imagine that the mimosa tree came first, you know, because mimosa tree has been around longer than champagne. Um, so, but these are these gorgeous little fairy flowers. These are a, a pile of flowers that I, after I'd gathered a bunch and this is like, you know, these are sitting in a bowl. We're just gonna give you an idea of what the close up of the flowers look like because often when I'm driving by the trees, I almost don't notice them because they're just these little like red dots in the tree. But um, if you're walking up close to them, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, that's amazing. And there's a picture of the leaves here in the next shot. I couldn't really find a photo that showed off both the leaves and the flowers well at the same time. But this very divided leaf where it's like almost fern-like, but these, tree these leaves are big. And that's how to tell mimosa. The, the botanical name actually is not mimosa, it's albizia. 
Um, I'm saying this because there are trees that are in the mimosa genus, and these have a common name of mimosa, but the botanical name is not, just for those of you following along in botanical world. So Albizia julibrisin, the uh, botanical name is on the previous slide. And this is an amazing uplifting plant. Uh, both the bark and the flowers are used for medicine. Um, what I put here was like mood lifter, antidepressant. I, it kind of sums it up, but it doesn't really express what this plant is all about. Um, I use the tincture of this mostly, but you can also use it as a tea. Um, and I find that the, it was, it's, it's a major medicine in Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. Um, the bark goes a little bit deeper in the body and the flowers are a little bit more superficial, but sometimes you want that superficial, like superficial isn't bad. Um, like mimosa flowers, uh, they provide this really kind of like bubbly effervescent, just like almost like just kind of like an immediate uh, mood lift. It's a really nice thing if you're just feeling like a little, just a little melancholy. It's nice to like lift up, um, you know, lift up the spirits a little bit. Um, the bark penetrates a little bit deeper. It's not so like bubbly. I really do think of the flowers as having this bubbliness, this, uh, I don't know, it's probably like a fun tea to drink when you're at a party. It's like, you know, and it's not an inebriant. I'm not saying it gets you high. It just makes you feel good. It, it makes you feel like, hey, you know what? Everything's okay. Who couldn't use some of that? But I do find the bark goes a little bit deeper in the body. So the bark I've kind of used more for people who have like stuck emotions. It helps kind of move things a little bit as well. So stuck emotions, frustration, melancholy, it's a bit more set in. Uh, I've even used it for PTSD and trauma, um, especially for times when like people have like past trauma and they can't sleep. They have like, they wake up in the middle of the night, their, their thoughts are worried. Mimosa bark is a really good one maybe along with some other herbs to help people sleep. Whenever in this presentation, by the way, I talk about diseases. Um, there's a reason I actually asked Jamie to say that piece about not asking for personalized uh, recommendations because there's no like one herb for PTSD. There's no one herb for COVID. There's no one herb for urinary tract infections or depression or anxiety. It really depends how it's manifesting for each person. Some people, mimosa is a perfect herb as for depression. Some people, it might be St. John's wort. Some people, it might be uh, B vitamins. Uh, some people might be like, quit your job and get some fresh air. <laughs> Move to Colorado. I don't know. Um, and that's why it's hard to like answer personal questions. But um, yeah, but maybe if people are interested, I could like, you know, give you my email at the end. If you, if you have questions, we can talk a little bit. Um, okay, so that's the last of our trees. And before we move on to the weeds, I just wanna like stop about 7.30 right now. So yeah, let's stop and see if, uh, yeah. let have like five minutes of questions. How about that? Okay. Um, so right now, there's no questions in the Q&A, but uh, go ahead and feel free to, if you have any questions so far on sumac or sassafras or mimosa or anything else, and uh, go ahead and, and throw that in the Q&A, and Corey Pine will be happy to answer them right now. Um, we do have one that just popped up. Somebody's asking if this will be available as a replay. Um, and are you asking if this will be recorded? Uh, if so, it will be, and um, it will be posted on the library's YouTube channel in three days, maybe a week, and I'll send out um, a little email to everyone that's here tonight uh, to let folks know that it's live and, and where the link can be found. Cool. Any other, any other questions? I, I could just keep going. Uh, yeah, another question. Let's see. You mentioned sumac is harvested in fall. Do the other trees have best times to harvest? Oh, yeah. Good question. Um, for the sassafras, I like, I, um, 
I don't know. Like I, I really like listening to like what like what old timers have to say because it's like there's that tradition. Like we don't always know, don't know why, but that's like how it's been done. There's usually some kind of wisdom in that. So yeah, like a, an old timer once told me like you should like pick sassafras in the spring when the leaves are just coming out. Actually, what he told me was like when the leaves are about the size of a quarter. And I've never found the leaves at just that perfect time. And I have sassafras like like out my backyard. So don't worry about the size of a quarter, but like springtime when the leaves are first coming on, I think that's, it doesn't have to be that week. It can be like the week before, like it can be like, you know, within that month or two, it doesn't need to be that specific. Mimosa, I usually like harvesting the bark, April, May, June, well, if you can find it in April, the leaves don't usually come on mimosa until late. It doesn't usually leaf out until after almost all the other trees have seen it leaf out as late as like late May or early June. Um, well, that's actually a great time to harvest the bark is like May and June. I find when I do that, I can, it, the bark just peels right off. It comes off very easily. And then the flowers you'd want to harvest when they're around, which probably from like late June through like August and then September if you're lucky. It's weird. I find different trees seem to flower at different times. Some trees will start blooming in June. Some will start blooming in July. Some will even start blooming like in early August. Yeah, so it's kind of harvesting times for those. I'll make sure to like address that with the future plants, like when to harvest. Other questions? That's it so far. Um, I did look up while you were uh, chatting there. You, uh, there are multiple copies of your book in the library, by the way. So not just at Fairview. We can we can send this book to any library that uh, that folks would like to pick it up at. Cool. Good. Lovely. All right. Keep throwing your questions in there. We'll we'll do some more Q and A at the end here. Yeah. Questions come up. Just pop them in there, and then when we get to the Q and A, we'll just answer them in whatever order feels good. <laughs> Maybe what order they came in, I don't know. Um, okay, I've been talking fast. I'm gonna try to slow down a little bit. This is kudzu. I don't know if anyone really needs an introduction to kudzu, <laughs> but if you do, this is the wall of kudzu. Um, I don't remember where this photo is from. I think actually this photo is from one of my teachers, Seven Song, did this, took this photo. Um, but often you just see this, this wall, you know, like you're driving through the country and you see like an abandoned barn or an abandoned truck and it's just covered in vines. It's probably kudzu. The plant that ate the sap, it's been called. Um, there's a close up of the leaves. So when you get close, ready to harvest, you want to make sure you're harvesting the right thing. Uh, so leaves of three kudzu would be. Um, joking because people always say leaves of three, poison ivy. But this one's, it looks very different than poison ivy. And if poison ivy grew like kudzu did, we'd all be in a lot of trouble, or at least those of us who get allergic, which is not everyone. So the kudzu flowers smell almost exactly like Welch's grape jelly. I don't know why, some weird trick of nature, but it's just, it's not just grape jelly. It's for some reason, it's that particular. <laughs> Bread. And they have some medicinal use. I haven't really looked much looked into it. Mostly what we use is the root. Roots we usually harvest in fall. And this plant is a lot easier to harvest in fall. You wait until like the really hard frost and all the leaves die. Because otherwise it's really hard to tell where the roots are. Um, the best way to dig a root of kudzu, like, I mean, I've used um, for digging roots like this, that they're really long tap roots. Uh, I often use what's called like a nursery shovel or a trenching shovel. They're like long and thin, not like a wide, you know, kind of spade shaped sh shovel, but like kind of like long and thin. Um, probably the best thing if you really want to get all the kudzu root though, might be a backhoe. Because <laughs> these roots go way, way down into the earth. This isn't a major medicine, but it is a medicine that's used in several different Chinese medicine formulas. Let's talk about the medicinal use of it. Oops, oh, honeysuckle's next, let's try to sneak in there. So the root is used in traditional Chinese medicine. It is actually great for alcoholism. It's kind of ironic though, because it's also good for hangovers. 
Um, so it seems to help hangovers. Uh, it has some action on the way the liver processes alcohol, which makes sense as to like why it'd be good for hangovers, but I'm not sure why. But I actually read this study where people were like, there were like two groups and um, there was like the control group and the study group and they were like given, um, <laughs> they were given a six pack of beer and a television and the beer was like on a scale, like it was on a table and there was a scale on the table, you know, they just kind of made. And so the people in the, the group, they got um, the kudzu and they found that the people in the kudzu group uh, drank less beer than the um, people in the control group, which of course brought up a really important question for me, which is, you know, how do people get into a study like this? They get paid for this? They really get paid. Just like sit there and watch TV and take cousins. It's like, these people lucked out. They didn't take some weird experimental drug. Hmm. <clears throat> Anyhow, sounds like a fun study. If you like beer. If you don't like beer, not so fun a study. <clears throat> and so kudzu reduces desire for alcohol. It's not a cure for alcoholism, right? I mean, there's a lot of psychological issues that go on with that, but it decreases desire. I make kudzu as a glycerin extract. Glycerin is another uh, solvent that we use in herbal medicine uh, as like a way to make a liquid extract that's non-alcoholic. So it's used a lot for kids' formulas and to make alcohol-free extracts, kind of like alcohol-free tinctures, really. Um, but I do it in glycerin. I do it in alcohol and in glycerin. And um, the glycerin is just really great, um, specifically for people who are trying to quit alcohol. When they get that craving, they can take a little bit of the, the uh, kudzu glycerite, and it seems to help. Or you can take it as capsules. I had a, a friend who took it as capsules instead to reduce her craving for alcohol. Uh, so having made it, before I give anything to anyone else, I'd like to try it myself. One of the things I found about the kudzu glycerin that I was not expecting is that it's really good antacid. Like kudzu is really moist. It's very like it's very moist root, and it's juicy and it's uh, soothing and it's cooling. Um, matter of fact, there's a starch that's extracted from kudzu called kuzu. So it's like kudzu but without the D. It's used in macrobiotic cooking, kind of like cornstarch. It's used to like thicken up things. Um, but it's also taken by itself as an antacid, as like, uh, yeah, for upset stomach with like more acidy indigestion as opposed to like stuck food indigestion. Not so much I ate too much food, but like I ate too much uh, spicy food or, um, but yeah, I find that the glycerin extract is better than that, than the, for that acid stomach than the tincture. And it does have very moistening energy to it. So it moistens the lungs in dry conditions. Uh, and traditionally it's used in Chinese formulas and a lot of cold and flu formulas um, for when there's muscle ache that accompanies a viral infection. So just recently, I read that kudzu actually does have some antiviral properties on its own. I really don't know how strong they are. Um, they just, I mean, a lot of things can be antiviral. I mean, hell, I don't know. Maybe Brussels sprouts are antiviral, but you're not going to use them to like treat like a major infection. Um, I don't think of kudzu as being strongly antiviral, but it's in formulas for, for uh, viral infections. It's even, I've seen it in some COVID formulas. And it's not that it kills like the, the virus. What it does is it helps support the body. If there's like a virus that's uh, causing dryness and causes like a lot of stiffness in the shoulders and upper back, you can add a little bit of kudzu root to the formula and it helps uh, moisten the lungs and the respiratory system and helps kind of like um, relieve some of that muscle tension. So yeah, muscle aches with viral infections. Yeah, kudzu, who knew? Um, okay, next plant, how are we doing for time? We'll do one more and then we're gonna stop, let's see. 
we have honeysuckle, we have Japanese knotweed, those are our last two names. Let's talk about honeysuckle, because this one is Lanistera japonica. There are native species of honeysuckle, and what I'm talking, I don't know if those are medicinal. Um, I don't even think they have a history of medicinal use, or at least not in the same way. But the one, if there is an invasive honeysuckle in your yard, it's probably the Japanese honeysuckle, Lanistera japonica. It's the one that's a vine. Most of the native ones are shrubs and bushes. Well, I guess kind of the same thing, but um, the one the one species that I know that's a vine, it has both white flowers and yellow flowers on it. That's the one that I'm talking about using for medicine. And even though it's a beautiful picture of the flowers, where you actually want to harvest it when it looks like this. Um, and it's that kind of club shape. It's gonna, that flower that I circled, that probably opened the day after I took the photo. I think the reason that, the, that this is traditionally done that way, if you picked it with the flower open, it would just kind of wilt and go. So maybe like these club shaped things last longer, you can dry them. Don't know if it matters if you're just gonna like harvest them and throw them in alcohol or glycerin right away. Um, you probably even do a vinegar extract if you wanted to, but honeysuckle, great antiviral. So the flower buds are what are used. Secondarily, not quite as good, but you can use the vines. And they flower for a while, but the best time to harvest them is when they first come out in like April and May, because that's when you have a huge abundance of them and it takes a long time. You really have to kind of go through, get a friend, because you just split the medicine with them or something or offer to treat them when they're sick, if you're at that level and you feel comfortable saying that. Um, but you, it just takes a long time to get a very, to fill a pint jar with honeysuckle flowers that don't weigh a lot. Um, so go to a place where there's a bunch of it, which is many places, uh, and just pick to your heart's content. It is an exotic invasive. So yeah, it's, you're not gonna like harm the environment by picking a whole bunch of flowers. Um, and in Chinese medicine, it's one of the major antiviral herbs. For those of you who know, there's a, um, how do I do this? No. Okay, I guess maybe just write on you. But there's there's a Chinese formula that's famous. It's like the echinacea of Chinese medicine. It's called Yin Chao. I'm gonna try to do this by drawing because um, I can't figure out how to like type onto the slide. I'm not the best artist to begin with. Chao. How do you spell Chao? It's one of these weird spellings. It's one of these things that if you're at the food co-op. Uh, okay, that was too big. We'll just leave that. There you go. Yin Chao. Yin Chao is like, you know, you go to an acupuncturist and it's like, ah, I think I'm coming down with something. Like, I feel a little bit sick. They're like, oh yeah, just here's some, here's some Yin Chao. Take two and call me in the morning kind of thing. Um, and the main two ingredients in there are honeysuckle flowers. There's like eight ingredients in there, but the main two ingredients honeysuckle flowers and forsythia fruit. Now the forsythia that we grow around here doesn't actually produce fruit. So that sucks. We can't use our forsythia. It's actually a different species. Um, I was talking with a, an herbalist who's more chemical knowledge than me. And he said, you could probably use the flowers of forsythia, but I'm not really entirely sure. But honeysuckle flowers, I've tinctured them. You could also use them as a, as a simple tea. Um, as good as they taste and as good as they smell, when you actually make a tea or a tincture out of them, they're actually a bit bitter. They have that sweetness of the flower and the nectar, but there's more of like a bitterness to it. Just warning you, they're not as, not as yummy as you might think. Um, cool. Did I say I was going to stop? What time is it? 7.45. Okay. Um, I mean, if there's no, I see there's a couple questions. Japanese knotweed, Rhinotria japonica, used to be polygonum cuspidatum. This is a nice picture of the flowers and the leaf shape. But when you see it, it's the thing that just grows all along creeks and rivers. It's just all along the French Broad River. Um, it's just that weed. 
it grows up to be like 12 feet tall in one year, then it dies back down and it has these like reddish stems that just, it's a nice picture, but it doesn't show as much the detail. It doesn't look quite the way that you see it. Um, but you might already know Japanese knotweed. It's, there's other knotweeds that are small that are just like, you know, foot tall, two feet tall, but this is the one that's like eight feet tall, 10 feet tall, big. The root is uh, used in Chinese medicine. If anybody's into Chinese medicine, you can ask me the Chinese names and I'll tell you that. The young shoots, it's related to uh, rhubarb. So I've actually harvested the shoots when they're just popping up and they come up really, really fast. But if you catch them right in that, like the few days when they're like only like, you know, this tall, you can cut them and cook them just like rhubarb. They have a nice sour flavor. You can make like uh, Japanese knotweed, strawberry, strawberry Japanese knotweed uh, pie and then invite me over because that sounds delicious. Um, so young shoots, edible cooked. The edible, the older shoots might still be edible, but they're just way, way, way too tough and fibrous. You just would never be able to chew it. So Japanese knotweed, considered like a noxious weed, hated by a lot of people, but it is a wonderful anti-inflammatory. It's antioxidant. And it's often used for like these long-term inflammatory conditions. There is a uh, chemical, some, some of you might've heard about um, this chemical that's in red wine. Um, the, 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 my brain just stopped there, but there's a chemical in red wine that's like a great antioxidant. Anyone, studio audience, can I dial a friend? Um, Uh, it's not coming to me right now, but you can actually buy it as a separate supplement. Um, if you know it, just put it in the Q&A. Um, and it's, people say like, oh, there's this whole like French paradox that like the people in red, people in uh, France, they, they eat all this fat, but they still have good blood pressure. And it's uh, because they drink so much red wine. But the truth is, uh, that fat's really not all that bad for us to begin with. Uh, it depends what kind of oil, what kind of fat, but that's a different conversation. Um, and so the way they described, the way that they figured it out is that, oh, there's this um, antioxidant in red wine. And that's why it's so good. Po resveratrol, that's what it is. So polyphenols, resveratrol, did someone already type it in? Yes, you got it. Ding, ding. Okay, points to Trish and Angela. Thank you. So, um, oh, I'm gonna turn that back off. So as much resveratrol as there is in red wine, there is so much more in Japanese knotweed. Um, you can buy resveratrol just by itself as like an anti-inflammatory. Uh, Japanese knot, knotweed has one of the highest natural sources of resveratrol. So great tea, tincture, uh, the roots, you can dig them pretty much any time of year. I'll probably just, you know, dig them in the spring or the fall when the, you know, energy is a bit more down. Um, and just use them as like a, just a general tonic. They've also been used as part of a protocol for Lyme disease. I've seen them in some like COVID protocols. I really don't know if it's effective or not. I mean, just, I mean, I'm not just saying that because this is being recorded. I'm saying that as an herbalist. Um, I, I mean, Maybe it's doing something supportive in that, you know, antiviral protocol, but I don't think it's really antiviral. Um, I think the way that it works on Lyme disease is by reducing inflammation. Um, I don't think it kills spirochetes either. I think that um, some of the symptoms people have from Lyme disease is cause this chronic inflammation that goes on and affects so many different parts of our body. You take an herb that's gonna reduce inflammation and have this antioxidant effect, um, it's gonna reduce symptoms. And I think that's what's going on with uh, Japanese knotweed. I should stop. I said I was going to stop at like quarter of it. It's like 10 of. So, and there's probably more, there's more, there's always more. But those are the ones I really wanted to talk about. I've got a couple more if there's no questions, but let's open it up for questions and see, see what's out there. What you got? Hit me, hit me with your best shot. Um, well, the first question I think is going to be a question for me. It says, will your book be available on Libby, which is our digital library? 
It is currently not, but um, we can request that it that it be purchased for that collection. And I, I've already gone ahead and done that. Um, so hopefully it will be available electronically as well. Uh, another question here, uh, back to uh, sassafras and kudzu. How do you harvest the bark of sassafras and how do you prepare the kudzu root? Mm. So how do you harvest the, the bark? I mean, the, the best part, I mean, the sassafras bark is pretty good, but the sassafras root is even better. And um, you get a, I actually use a, a, a mattock, which a mattock, it kind of looks like a pickaxe, but it has like, um, you know, like the back of a hammer, it has that claw. It has, but it has that one side is that the, a pointy part at one point is like this, you know, kind of like claw side of a hammer. And I'll go through and like pull it up. Um, sassafras trees, often where they grow, they grow in like these tight clusters. And you know, if there's 10 of them in a small space, not all of them are going to grow to maturity. So I try to thin, I find a place where there's a bunch of them and I try to thin it out so that some, some ones can come more to maturity. I harvest sassafras. I find it probably easiest to harvest when it's about like five to seven feet high. It's about, it's about my height. When it, you can harvest them when they're really young too. You just don't get a whole lot of root from them. And if they're much older than that, you get these giant roots that are really hard to dig out of the ground. Um, and yeah, so I just kind of like go in there, like dig up. The roots that don't tend to go straight down. They tend to kind of go down and then like run. And that's why it's good to like take the, uh, the mattock and kind of like go around the root, just kind of pull it up. And you just have to kind of trail the root out. Um, if it's a really big, then sometimes I'll like put in a, a burlap sack and mash it up a little bit and like hit it with a hammer and that'll break the root bark off. But if it's like small, if it's like, you know, like so big or less, I might just like, just chop the whole thing. I, just, I have pruners. So, you know, a good pair like Falco or Corona pruners, hopefully it's okay to drop name brands, but you know, spend $30 or more in a nice pair of pruners. I use them for harvesting plants, but get a bypass pruners specifically. It's also great for like chopping up sassafras roots and other roots. Oh, and of course you want to wash the root before you chop it up. Just like you'd wash a carrot or a sweet potato before you cook it. I don't know. I could talk more about harvesting, but I think hopefully that answered the question. And then the other question, Jamie, was... How do you prepare the kudzu root? Yeah. So for the kudzu root, um, I think traditionally people would, like in Chinese medicine, they would make a, uh, they would simmer it. They would chop it up, add maybe like a tablespoon per cup of water and just like simmer it for like 15 to 20 minutes. Personally, what I do is I dig it up, chop it, um, wash it, dig it up, wash it, then chop it. Uh, it's just like little chunks and just throw it in a jar covered in alcohol to make a tincture or throw it in a jar covered in glycerin. Um, I do it a bit more specifically than that, but I don't want to get too much into the medicine making. I would, you know, like I do like a weight to volume ratio, but I don't really want to explain too much of that right now, but it's worth doing if you're into like medicine making. Um, and for those of you that haven't seen Corey Pine's book yet, I mean, it is, it's incredibly comprehensive and you go into, into a lot of detail on how to harvest all of these, how to make these tinctures, how to make the teas and the glycerins and, um, it's a really, how, how many species do you cover in that book? A hundred and six. I know it's a lot. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and they're all plants that I've seen. They don't all grow here in the Southern Appalachians because the, the, the book covers from about like the Pennsylvania, Maryland border to the North End through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina about central Florida. South Florida is like a whole different world, botanically speaking. So I, I don't cover a lot of species that are just endemic there, but you know, things that grow in South Georgia also grow in like Gainesville and Orlando. And then West to Louis, Louisiana and East Texas, and then up through uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, all that. So it covers a pretty broad area, but I would say probably two thirds of the plants you're gonna find it's not like right in the mountains, like within an hour or two. There's some things you have to like drop down in the Piedmont to find, like 
sweet gum and passion Passion flower is easy to grow here, but it doesn't grow commonly in the wild, but you get down to the Piedmont, it's just a common weed. You know? <laughs> wow, that is, uh, right now that's all the questions that we have in our Q&A. Um, Corey Pine, if folks wanted to connect with you um, after this program, what is the best way that they can do that? Probably, probably oh, email is the easiest, because I, I don't, I hardly ever answer my phone. <laughs> um, is, is it, can I type my uh, email in the Q&A? How about that? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it should be able to be seen by, by everyone. And your school has a website and, and it does. there's more information there. How do I? I, can, I don't know how to like type a question because I'm the, so I'm just going to like, uh, Leslie, you're very welcome. And I'm going to like type my uh, email address in response to your question. Cause that, so it's director at Blue Ridge School.org. Don't send it to Blue Ridge School.com. That's a boys prep school in Virginia. I didn't really think about that so much. <laughs> I don't know. Can you all see that show up? It's going to show up in answered now. I've moved it to answered. But director, because I'm the director of the herb school um, at Blue Ridge School, because Blue Ridge School of Herbal Medicine, but it's dot org. Perfect. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Like, please, um, I'm saying, like, feel free to, like, if you have other questions to come up after, after this, feel free to email me. Uh, for complex medical questions, I might say like, oh, you know, a consultation might be good. It doesn't have to be with me. I can also recommend other people, uh, you know, no conflict of interest, but I'm happy to answer like, you know, uh, general questions or like, you know, more like, you know, if, if, if it's a question I can answer without having to do a whole lot of research or ask a whole lot more questions, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, <laughs> I want to be a resource for y'all. Well, thank you very much, Corey Pine. We're we're really happy to have you um, tonight, and we're we're happy that we have your book on the shelves of the libraries. Um, like I said before, this session is recorded, so if you uh, if anyone wants to go back and reference it or share it, um, that it'll be up on the library's YouTube channel in about a week or so, and I'll send out an email to all of our participants tonight with a link to that when it's up there. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thank you all for coming today. Thank you. Thank you for being interested in the plants. I really do feel that the more we learn the plants around us, the more connected we'll feel with nature, the more at home we'll feel, you know, in this life on this earth. And I, th for me, I find that that is a balm for my soul. It's helpful for anxiety, for depression, just knowing that there's plants that grow around us that can help us, that can take care of us. We're not injured in this earth. We're, we're part of this earth. And that's just a really powerful thing to remember. Great way to leave it. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful night. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I could like stop the sharing now. <laughs> just be like the two of us. Should we do some kind of like outro thing? You know, like the credits are rolling and we're like doing the little- Oh, hands. <laughs> you had a couple more thank yous rolling in the Q&A. I don't know if you saw Oh, them. I didn't see those. Oh, thank you. Folks are appreciative. Very helpful. Oh, is there an app that can help us identify? Yes. I don't know which one, but I've seen people use apps and have good results. Um, I think iNaturalist is one. Oh, wait, there's one that one of my students recommended, like Snap or Blink or... Um, oh, it costs $30 a year, but uh, a friend of mine recommended, one of my students, that is, who's also a friend of mine, recommended Picture This. Said it was thirty dollars a year, but it gave more accurate results than some of the free ones. Um, but I haven't actually tried any of them yet. Uh, I use Merlin for bird ID, but I haven't tried the 
any of the plant ID apps. All right, I think that's it. All right. Fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for hosting this. This has been great. Really enjoyed it myself. Have a great night. You too. Take care. Be well.